Hi, good evening, everybody. Um, and thank you for joining us this evening in person for our small socially distanced audience here at the University of Chicago Grand Campus in Hong Kong, as well as everybody who's joining us uh, virtually um, online. Um, uh, thank you for joining us for our virtual program about uh, the history of the women's suffrage movement in the United States. Uh, to kick things off, I'd like to welcome um, Mark Barnacow, the Executive Director of the University of Chicago's uh, Grand Campus here in Hong Kong. Thank you, Tom. Good evening. My name is Mark Barnico, and I'm the Executive Director of the University of Chicago, Francis and Rose Yuen campus here in Hong Kong. I want to uh, take this chance to welcome the Consul General and his team from the United States Consulate in Hong Kong and Macau to the Yuen campus this evening for this important historical event, 100 years of women's suffrage in America. I'd also like to extend our warm welcome to our audience and this special evening special guest panelists participating in tonight's program. The University of Chicago UN campus in Hong Kong is our premier location in Asia, representing UChicago values of free and open discourse, rigorous debate, and exchange of ideas. In these classrooms, we teach our executive MBA students from throughout Asia. We also host UChicago study abroad college students from Chicago, as well as executive education, innovation and entrepreneurial programs, and social enterprise programs. Our UChicago faculty visit Hong Kong regularly to teach, provide lectures for the community, and collaborate with faculty and partners from other institutions in Hong Kong and throughout Asia. The University of Chicago is a leading global academic institution. In addition to the UN campus in Hong Kong, we also have centers in Beijing and Delhi. And last year, we also opened a new campus in London and recently announced a new campus facility that we're building in Paris. For more information about the UN campus in Hong Kong though, please visit our website at www.uchicago.hk. There you'll also find information on how to register for our new climate change series, one and a half degrees, which begins tomorrow evening at this same time. I hope you can join us. Now I'd like to turn the stage over to Consul General Haskam Smith from the United States Consulate. Thank you, Mark. Uh, good evening. Uh, it's really a pleasure to uh, say good evening and also good morning to all of our friends here in person and also virtually. And of course, special thanks uh, to our speakers who are joining us uh, from the United States, uh, Colleen Jenkins and uh, Manise Wall. Colleen is in Connecticut. Manise is in New Mexico. They are both up uh, very early, so we're grateful to them. They both bring uh, very rich and important uh, experience and perspectives on this issue, and I know that we're going to have a really vibrant uh, conversation. Of course, the consulate uh, has been proud uh, to play its role in honoring the centennial of the 19th Amendment uh, that gave women the right to vote in the United States. That was the fruition of decades of advocacy and commitment and dedication uh, by thousands of women uh, and men uh, to create change. It's a powerful legacy and it's a powerful example. And uh, we are uh, especially appreciative of Mark and all of our friends here at the University of Chicago uh, for hosting the exhibition uh, since last November. Uh, and uh, this is, I think, a particularly fitting way uh, to uh, bid uh, the exhibition farewell from its uh, stint here. And uh, it will be appearing uh, elsewhere in Hong Kong in the coming weeks. We'll have more information on the consulate's website. Uh, and we encourage uh, you, uh, friends, family, and organizations uh, to take advantage uh, of the exhibition uh, and its example and the conversations uh, that it sparks. Uh, so with that, I'm looking forward to a really uh, excellent program. Thank you. So as the Consul General mentioned, we're, uh, we're joined tonight by two very special guests uh, who are up very early in their time. Um, we're joined with, by Colleen Jenkins and Manise Wall. Um, my name is Tom Hui, and I'm the Cultural Affairs Officer at the U.S. Consulate, and I'm serving as tonight's facilitator and moderator. 
Um, to begin, I thought I would read Colleen and Manisa's bios, um, and then what we've asked for them to do is to present, uh, to give a short presentation. Colleen will be speaking about uh, the women's uh, leadership and strategy elements, um, and Manise is uh, going to walk us through some of the inspirational figures uh, in uh, that she, as an artist, has uh, has has as an artist and author, have has both written and uh, created art about. Um, so uh, please allow me to read uh, Colleen's bio. Um, Colleen Jenkins is the great-great-granddaughter of Elizabeth Cady Stanton, a pioneer suffragist. Through the years, Colleen has used her talents to inspire both awareness and pride in women's history by preserving the history of the women's rights movement, educating the public on this history, and promoting the advancement of women's rights. Colleen is the co-founder and president of the Elizabeth Cady Stanton Trust, a collection of 3,000 objects of women's suffrage memorabilia that has been featured in museums, presidential libraries, books, television, and film, as well as used in congressional testimony. Colleen is also the vice president of Monumental Woman and helped to break the bronze dome over Central Park in New York City with the installation of the first statue of real woman in honor of the centennial of the 19th Amendment of the US Constitution. Colleen has co-authored a book, 33 Things Every Girl Should Know About Women's History, and produced the television documentary, An American Revolution, Women Take Their Place. Her 2009 testimony before the US Senate contributed to the passage of federal legislation, creating a national trail of historic sites coordinated by Women's Rights National Historic Park. She firmly believes equality is attainable. Manise, Manise Wall is a graphic artist, award-winning author and writer whose work focuses on women's suffrage and American sheroes. Her creations highlight dynamic issues of interest from the past and the present, expressed through social commentary, fiction, nonfiction, parody, satire, and humor. Both her visual and written works have been published in numerous magazines, books, and online journals. Her most recent book, We Demand the Right to Vote, The Journey to the 19th Amendment, um, allows uh, Minnesota's writing and illustrations transport readers to the American women's suffrage movement to uncover a fuller picture of the events and people that shaped today's America. Her work inspires reflection, conversation, and action. And you've all seen uh, her work uh, upstairs uh, as well as in the video uh, today. Um, and uh, at this time, I'd like to ask Colleen um, if you could go ahead and uh, share some thoughts with the, our, our audiences. Thank you ever so much. I, I am joined by my grandmother uh, and I thank you for inviting me for this celebration of women's rights. The United States is a nation of laws and this year we're celebrating a law that's very important to me, my gender and the United States. It's the 100th anniversary of the 19th amendment of the US constitution. And what I'd like to do is show you the 19th Amendment of the U.S. Constitution. The right of citizens to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or any state on account of sex. Now I want to go back to the University of Chicago's exhibit. Here is my great, great grandmother, Elizabeth Cady Stanton. She was called the philosopher of the women's rights movement. She was a writer, a speaker, and she co-convened the first women's rights convention in Seneca Falls in 1848. Elizabeth had seven children. Harriet is one of their children who marched in her footsteps. For instance, she organized mass marches up Fifth Avenue in New York City in support of women's suffrage. She also lobbied the New York State Legislature. Here is Elizabeth's granddaughter, my grandmother. And she was part of the mass movement and she also took advantage of her access to higher education by becoming one of the first female civil engineers to graduate uh, in 1905. I want you to know that if you look at these three generations, they represent 72 years of struggle to gain women's right to vote. 
Uh, once I asked a women's history scholar, what was Elizabeth Cady Stanton's contribution to American democracy? And what she said is she connected women and law. Well, how did that happen? Elizabeth grew up in a soup of law. All around her was law, 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 law. For instance, here's her father. He was a judge in the courthouse in their town. He also served in Congress, the United States Congress, as well as on the United States Supreme Court. Law clerks studied with him the law. And in their, uh, attached to their home, the family home was Judge Katie's law office. Here, I would like to tell a quick, great story of how Elizabeth became sensitized to the law. This is the coral necklace that Elizabeth Cady Stanton was given as a child as a Christmas present. And one law clerk said, you see that necklace? She said, yes. And he said, how, who owns it? And she says, I do, it's a gift to me. And he says, well, when you get married, your husband will be able to take that necklace and swap it for a cigar and light it and your necklace will go up in smoke. Well, Elizabeth as a child was indignant. She thought this was unfair. And this is the childhood, the soup of law she was brought up in. And fortunately, one of the first things that were changed in New York state, for example, were marital women property rights so that they had some type of legal right to what they owned. This is the period, our photo of Elizabeth that I'm most proud of. Most of the time you see her as an older woman, but here is her most important period as a 32 year old, a mother with child, but also a proponent of a movement. Um, she and a handful of women gathered to address the rights and the wrongs of women. And they convened the first women's rights convention in Seneca Falls. And just before the convention, they said, we need a document. How do we express ourselves, what our goal is? And they came with an irrefutable argument. I want to read just a portion of that document that Elizabeth read to 300 people in the convention. She read, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men and women are created equal, that they are endowed equal by their creator with certain inalienable rights, among them life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. Of course, you recognize this as the ideas of 1776, and they were applied to 1848. And it is yet another extension of human rights to women. I want to wrap up by saying that my mother was an architect for 60 years. And here's a building that she designed, a house. This is a two dimensional plan from which a three dimensional object was created, a building. Here is the Declaration of Independence, again, a two-dimensional plan from which a three-dimensional nation is built. And here is the Women's Declaration of Independence based on yet another attempt to form a more perfect union that builds on fundamental principles of men and women are created equal. Of course, the most controversial thing in 1848 was the idea that the vote is the fundamental right of citizenship. 
On her deathbed, Elizabeth Cady Stanton wrote to President Theodore Roosevelt in 1902. She said, surely there is no greater monopoly than that of all men in denying all women a voice in the laws they are compelled to obey. Alas, Elizabeth died 18 years prior to the passage of the 19th Amendment. But by then, there is a mass movement in this bloodless revolution. No guns. It was just constant 72 years of fight. Today, I stand on the shoulders of the men and the women that marched before me, and I am grateful. In no way do I think American history is perfect. For instance, how did the United States leave women out of the Constitution, their right to vote, when women constituted 51% of the population? That's not perfect. But I believe as a nation, we are always striving to create a more perfect union so Elizabeth now will have the last word. She said, come, come, my conservative friend. Wipe the dew off your spectacles and see the world is moving. So I thank you for the honor of sharing my family and a movement with you. And I thank you personally for everything that you do to create perfect union throughout the world. Thank you so much, Colleen. Um, and there, <laughs> there will be plenty of time for questions and answers of, uh, in a little bit, but um, Manise, could we hear from you? Yes, thank you, Tom. And thank you to the US Consulate and the University of Chicago for organizing this event and for inviting me. And thank you for all the audience members for participating today. So I'm gonna tell you the story very briefly, the story of the American women's suffrage movement from 1848 to 1920. We'll take a brief look at some of the main leaders and some of the strategies they employed. Uh, we'll also be using my artwork as a guide. So let's begin. In the United States was founded in 1776. And at that time, women were not legally considered citizens and they were denied the right to vote for 144 years. In this first piece, we see Elizabeth Cady Stanton that Colleen just spoke of. And in this image, she is about to read the Declaration of Sentiments where she was talking to men, uh, a few men in the audience, but men in general, that they were the ones who had the power and women knew that they would have to get their help in getting women power. So that was in 1848. In our next image, you'll see Elizabeth Cady Stanton's very good friend, Susan B. Anthony. The two of them were lifelong friends, worked together for women's rights. Uh, Elizabeth was a fabulous writer, wrote a lot of the speeches that uh, Susan B. Anthony gave. She traveled across the United States giving these speeches. Oftentimes, food would be thrown at her because that was not considered a thing for a lady to do not only to talk in public, but to talk to crowds of men and women. Uh, the two of them helped found the National Women's Suffrage Association in 1869. And the focus there was on universal suffrage and a constitutional amendment for women's right to vote. In the next image, you'll see that uh, one of the ways that women we're trying to really tell the men we've got to do something here is through the amendments. Uh, the 14th Amendment was guaranteeing citizenship, but it didn't say specifically women. But it did say if you were born in the United States or a naturalized citizen, then you could vote. So women pushed that and they went and voted in the 1872 presidential election. Uh, they were arrested for it. Uh, many of them posted bail, but not Susan. She was a force to be dealt with. So she was arrested, jailed, tried. Um, she was found guilty. 
and charged a uh, hundred dollars fine for which she never did pay. She was released from jail, but the point was she really made a lot of history there and people learned of this through newspapers and that helped to move forward the women's movement. Okay, in our next piece, you'll see this is Sojourner Truth. At the time, in the 1800s, racism uh, was pervasive, and uh, as was slavery. So Sojourner, uh, she eventually, she was born into slavery, but she eventually escaped. She changed her name to Sojourner Truth uh, to represent how she wanted to travel about and speak for women's rights and against slavery. Uh, our next person is Lucy Stone. She was friends with Anthony and Stanton. Uh, she was a staunch advocate for equality, equality for all, uh, even so much so that she thought that it was unnecessary for women to change their family name when they married, and so she did not. It was very controversial at the time. These days, a lot of people don't think so much about that, so I'm just going to keep my name. She uh, also started her own organization called the American Woman Suffrage Association. Uh, her approach, different from uh, Anthony and Stanton's approach, was to go state by state. Uh, they were up to the 15th Amendment at the time, and they were hoping that would be for universal suffrage. And it turned out that Lucy Stone and many others were thinking that Black men deserved the right to vote. It would be an easier uh, amendment to get passed, and then women would get theirs afterwards. It incensed Anthony and Stanton. The three women parted ways as friends for quite some time, and then the two organizations were going along their own paths. But come 1890, they realized that they needed to join forces to then present a united front, and that would be the only way women would be able to win their right to vote. The struggle had already been long enough. So they joined together, and it was called the National American Woman Suffrage Association. Then towards the very end of the 19th century, in the 1890s, the bicycle became a very big deal. So that's going to be our next slide. The bicycle was a really big deal. Uh, there was a very famous article called uh, The New Woman, and uh, they talked about who, who, who is this new woman? Who are women? What should be their rights? And so the bicycle helped women really get out and get more freedom. Uh, one big reason was because of their outfits. Prior to the bicycle, where now they could wear uh, bloomers, women wore a lot of underclothes. Their underclothes could weigh as much as 14 pounds. And corsets, of course, were very restrictive. Women couldn't move very easily. So all that was changing. And also symbolic in that of more changes to come. Our next person is Mary Church Terrell. She was a very prominent Black woman, very well educated. She spoke three languages, traveled a lot, gave speeches, uh, taught. And along with lots of other women, she started the National Association of Colored Women in 1896. The uh, women's suffrage movement that we think of was pretty much all white women. And because of segregation and the norms of the time, the blacks and the whites really didn't work together much. They did a little bit, but not much. And so starting this organization, the National Association of Colored Women, it brought together over 100 black women's clubs with the motto, lifting as we climb, with the idea that if we lift up black women, we'll be able to lift up more the whole black community. So now we've come to the 20th century. Most of the original pioneers, suffrage pioneers are gone, but we have two new leaders who have stepped up and that's gonna be our next person, which is Carrie Chapman Catt. She is now the president of the National American Women's Suffrage Association took over for when uh, Susan B. Anthony retired. And then the next woman that we see here is Alice Paul. Her organization was the National Women's Party. And the two worked diligently. Both of these women were very hard workers, had a lot of different strategies, but their aim was a bit different. Uh, Carrie Chapman Catt, her aim was for a state by state approach, whereas Alice Paul believed in going straight for a federal government, uh, the, the amendment. 
So in the next image, you'll see they sent, both groups sent out what we call suffrage envoys. Uh, these were groups of women, usually small groups of women, and they would travel around the United States giving talks about women's suffrage. They would set up in schools, sometimes churches, community centers, put up banners like you see in this piece and talk and give out flyers about women's suffrage. Of course, they'd take donations. They were hoping to get people to change some of their leadership at a local level and then move towards the federal level. And then the next slide, you'll see that we have a parade. This was huge. This was a turning point in the women's suffrage fight. Their struggle had gone on for a really long time. And in 1913, Alice Paul put on this huge parade the day before Woodrow Wilson was to be inaugurated as president for his first term. She was a brilliant strategist. What we're seeing here in this image is another suffragist named Inez Milholland. She's astride her horse and she led the parade of about 8,000 women, 600,000 spectators and members of the press were there. So the next day, a lot of fantastic headlines. Some of them not terribly favorable, but a lot of them very favorable. The bottom line is they got a lot of attention. You'll see in the next image that men were very supportive at this time, well, at least a growing uh, support. They marched in the parade, uh, they had their their sisters, their wives, their daughters, all say, we want the vote, make it happen. And so these men were very supportive of that as well as very well connected with the legislature and in helping to bring about some of those changes. The next slide, we have a very fun way of getting the, the, the message out. They sent out and dropped suffrage bombs from planes. No, they weren't bombs, but they were yellow leaflets with information about women's rights and what the, uh, the people could do. So they, they dropped these over uh, large groups of people. Okay, and then the next one we have, this was a very controversial move. Another one, of course, done by uh, Alice Paul, who was big into making big splashes, uh, was picketing the White House. No one had picketed the White House before. And so women were the first to do that. And it was very controversial because women were still thought by most men that they should be seen and not heard, um, staying at home mostly, you know, not taking political opinions. So to be in front of the White House was absolutely outrageous. After a while, the administration couldn't stand it anymore. And they jailed these women and some of them were tortured in jail. Over time, of course, that all ameliorated and they were released from jail, said that what they did, what the uh, administration had done was wrong, picketing was legal, uh, and so they did move past that, but it got a lot more press, which was always Alice Paul's objective. Give us the press, we will get what we need. And then the last image we have here that you've seen in the exhibit is about ratification. Uh, come 1920, a, an amendment to the United States Constitution was passed for the guarantee that women in the United States could vote. So that's it for this. I know everybody's got lots of questions. There's a quick overview. So Tom, how shall we proceed? Uh, thank you very much, Manise. And thank you for using your artwork to tell um, the story of this movement. Um, I'd add that uh, in everybody's goodie bag who's joining us uh, uh, here at the University of Chicago, you are gonna take away some of Manise's artwork, uh, which is the, the Liberty uh, print. Um, so uh, um, I'm opening up the floor for questions. Um, because of social distancing, if anybody in the room here with us at the University of Chicago has questions, I'd ask you to just uh, raise your hand. Um, I'll call on you. And what I'll do is I'll repeat your question into the microphone. That way we're not sort of passing a microphone around to everybody. Um, uh, and also our folks who are joining us virtually, if you have questions, please go ahead and type those directly into the chat box. Uh, I have my computer in front of me and I'm happy to read those questions out loud for our speakers as well. Um, with that, um, I have some questions prepared, but does anybody in the audience have a question that we could ask our speakers? Which means I get to go first. Uh, so um, uh, we have a question. We took some questions uh, before from folks that we invited. Um, one of the questions is, um, uh, uh, Manise, as an artist and an author, what inspired you to do a series about the women's suffrage movement? 
Well, I have a daughter and she, at the time when I started the project was a teenager and she would come home from her American history classes and say, Ugh, what is up with this? Just all I'm studying about is dead white guys. <laughs> she says, we're not studying. She says, you know, we're in America. We should be studying about all ethnicities. And she says, and I'm female. Where are the women? We're not doing anything with them. So I thought, well, you know, for sure you think someone's going to do that at some point. And I was inspired by some other people I had known who didn't let the grass grow under them and said, you know, I can do certain things. I don't have to wait for somebody else to do it. So my daughter and I did a little bit of research and I was very inspired when I found these women who are wearing these amazing white outfits and sashes and marching and what is this? So that's what got me going on. I just couldn't let it go. And Manise, we had a quick follow-up question from our online audience, and it is, how can we get prints of Manise's work? Ah, okay. <laughs> well, they can go to my website, which is www.maniswall.com. And if you've got, um, you're on the webinar, so you're going to be able to see how you spell my name. So it's maniswall.com. And you're also, everybody's welcome to send me emails directly to talk with me. That's wonderful. And a question for Colleen, um, your modern day advocacy for women's rights and accomplishments is very inspiring. What's next? Well, um, I'm really excited to invite all of you to Central Park, New York City. Uh, what we did is we installed the statue of the first real women into Central Park for 165 years at this great public forum that has 42 million people visiting every year, there wasn't a single statue of a real woman. Woman, And now we have the women's rights pioneers of Sojourner Truth, Susan B. Anthony, and Elizabeth Cady Stanton. And uh, that, it, that has a life of its own. Yesterday, we were there celebrating Women's History Month, and we also rolled out a, a toolbox so that anyone in the world can uh, perhaps read our tool about our tools that we use for seven years in order to break the bronze dome over Central Park. And at this point, I think we need a little comedy that prior to this, this statue, the only statues of real women in Central Park, New York City, were Alice in Wonderland, Mother Goose, a witch, Juliet of Romeo and Juliet, a goddess, an angel. So that's not good enough. Uh, women are real. They have accomplishments, they have names, they have paper trails. So I, what's next is to come visit New York City and enjoy the life that the statue has taken on and inspires. I have some more questions from the audience. Oh, there's uh, somebody, somebody in the in-person audience here, please. So the question from the in-person audience is that Manise, you beautifully documented the women's suffrage movement, um, but is there any way you could talk about art within the movement itself? How was it playing a role or did it play a role within the movement? Yes, especially through magazines. Uh, there were several different magazines that came out over the years. Uh, the one, probably one of the most influential uh, was later on when they were getting closer to getting the, 20, the 19th Amendment passed. And that was called The Suffragist. And they had an artist who, um, she created interesting pieces for the covers, and uh, there were other magazines that incorporated artwork. Um, there was a lot of humorous artwork, <laughs> satirical things about, it was especially promulgated by men who were saying this was ridiculous, women shouldn't have this right, and they were painting them in very unfavorable fashions. Uh, but yeah, it, it grew over time, um, but it wasn't a, a huge portion of what they were doing, but magazines were, were a really big part of that. Another question from online is, um, 
how do we tackle hidden discrimination towards women, such as the income difference of women and men? Um, Colleen or Manise, either one? I, I think what's really great is to look forward, but also to look backwards. Uh, for almost 100 years, the Equal Rights Amendment has been proposed by the suffragists because they figured once you get the right to vote, then you must have constitutional protection for all of your other rights. And so what's great is we're on the cusp of celebrating the 100th anniversary of the Equal Rights Amendment. And may I say that both of these amendments are not strictly about women. These amendments are about universal suffrage. It protects men's right to vote as well as women's right to vote. And that is the same with the Equal Rights Amendment, that men have an opportunity to figure out how their rights should be protected as well as women. So uh, we're on the cusp of passing, of ratifying the 28th Amendment of the U.S. Constitution. I would, add to very that, I would add to that that it's a very complex and messy process because in America we have all these different uh, groups of people uh, and getting, getting people to pull together is a really hard thing. It's just a human thing. And we've been working at it a really long time. Uh, it's coming together more and more like Colleen said. So I'm very hopeful that we will pass the ERA and it's one of the major steps towards having equal rights for everyone. But it's still a work in progress. And we have a question in person here in Hong Kong. So the question is about, uh, we've learned that there are, there, there's been a history of, that there were groups of women demanding the right to vote that were largely white women. And there were also groups um, uh, composed of black women uh, and that the two groups uh, worked in parallel. But uh, the question is about sort of, did those two groups come together um, and how did they, did they ever work together? Well, I, I think it's not only black women, but I, I would like to point out that at this very first uh, anti, uh, very first uh, women's rights convention, and uh, and Elizabeth was extremely radical. She demanded elective franchise. Well, out of those three hundred people, only one person supported her motion and spoke to her motion, and that person was. Frederick Douglass. And these two people remained um, of the same mind for basically their whole lives, except when the pearly gates opened up after the Civil War. Who should go through those pearly gates to elective franchise? And sadly, it was determined that yet another group of males would go through. So, uh, and then I want to fast forward to the end of the 1800s where Sojourner Truth, for instance, stayed at Elizabeth Cady Stanton's home in New York City when yet another women's rights convention at uh, Cooper Union, a very important educational institution in New York City. So sometimes they work together, sometimes they had other methods and institutions through which they worked. But I, I think it's very easy to say that it mattered to women and there were multi-prongs to pass an amendment to the US Constitution. Yeah, I'll add to that to say that it's, it's good for us to remember about the history and what life was like then. We, we can't really judge what was going on then by today's standards of relations between uh, the different ethnicities. Uh, but back then, like I said, that uh, racism was pervasive and the two groups, blacks and whites, just didn't mix much. It was just a social taboo. And so Mary Church Terrell actually made a lot of inroads to uh, working with the white suffragists. And she had a plan 
that she encouraged black women to get involved in the temperance movement, saying if we can help out with temperance, then that will help ingratiate us to the white suffragists. She did give a few speeches to the national, uh, I think it was just the National Women's Suffrage Association, but they, blacks were not allowed to be members of the white groups. So there were tensions there, definitely, um, but the black women were very uh, wise and stepped up to form their own groups and they did make a lot of inroads and a lot of differences. But not as much as we have today. It's, it was a different world back then, for sure. A question from the virtual audience that brings us to sort of today um, in the United States. And the question is, of all the ongoing struggles in the United States, such as the COVID pandemic, post-pandemic economic recovery, Black Lives Matter, how do average Americans view gender inequality as a priority issue that they need to tackle? Well, I, I feel like our, uh, we have a grasp of a pandemic now. Um, with, and so that's moving ahead. I think we have a huge economic recovery it's impacted women um, and uh, a lot of other people of color as well as men. Um, but I think that we, that's what I really, really appreciated about the early suffragists as a role model. They never lost sight of a goal. And yes, Elizabeth Cady Stanton was addressing all sorts of women's rights from property, uh, the right to own property, to um, the access to higher education, access to um, elective franchise, but it, it had a singular goal of advancement of women. And um, I think that uh, that's critical. Uh, not only for women, but I would hope that men also address their abilities, for instance, I, with uh, equality, for instance, in the case of divorce, uh, who, who has title to the children. Um, I think if we go forward to try and create gender equality, I think that's a, it's something that matters to me and I would hope that it mar matters to other, gen other genders. I would say that they're viewing it more and more as one of the top priorities, uh, sort of like women getting the right to vote. It was one of the pivotal rights. And I think having that right for people today to have equality, that sets the stage for, uh, it's like a domino effect. With that in place, then the other dominoes will fall into place. But again, we're, we're working with, with people. We're all, we all have our issues, they're all different. They, we all have our points of view. And so it's a challenge to pull those together and find the commonalities. So it takes time, but once we're, we're finding more and more of those commonalities of our humanity and, and moving forward with that. So I'm very encouraged. A follow-up question uh, to what Colleen mentioned earlier about engaging men um, is, are there any good strategies on how to engage men in the gender equality movement? Actually, there's a book that's just recently been published and it's called Suffra Gents. And it's about suffrage and gentlemen and suffragettes. And uh, it takes up that point that obviously if women have no power, they have to rely on the power structure to accept their arguments and change the structure. So one of the points about the suffragettes is yes, be involved. Yes, lend your talents, lend, lend, lend your access to power, but don't take over the movement. Um, be a co-worker in the movement. And um, that's the point. Suffragettes, welcome. <laughs> I agree with what Colleen's saying. Uh, too often we are talking about women and the, the changes that women need to make, even in today's society, women need this, women this, women that. 
which of course is all incredibly important. I think we also need to shine a little bit of a light on how can men be a bit more malleable to then be accommodating of women, accommodating of their own paths so that we have a working together. Um, again, not easy, <laughs> but we, we have to work together. Another question from here in person in Hong Kong. So the question is in the United States um, for children who are now going through school, 10th or 11th or uh, any grade in the US, are there textbooks in the curriculum better reflecting uh, uh, diversity within gender, uh, uh, ethnicity and race? And so is it less about dead white guys? And I'm just repeating what I heard here in the room. <laughs> Well, I grew up in New York State, and this is actually the home of the, the beginning of the first women's rights convention. And I, in 10th grade, I studied for one year New York State history. And that period of history was only four sentence in a, a textbook that was this thick. So what's changed, for instance, in New York State, they have developed four core curriculums and one of the core curriculums is the women's rights movement, the women's suffrage movement. And I think the beauty of studying something like that is that if you want to know all of the arrows in the quiver of democracy, you by studying that movement will learn about them. So, um, and then what's phenomenal is the internet. For instance, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Susan B. Anthony, Matilda Jocelyn Gage, at, they realized a tremendous amount of information in newspapers and letters and journals were being collected, were being created by this movement. Well, if it's not preserved, then you, the future generations, will not know it. So what they did is they wrote these volumes, the history of women's suffrage, and the idea was to put them in every library in the United States. Well, guess what? It's even better. Right now, with the click of a computer key, and thanks to Project Gutenberg, all 7,000 pages of the history of women's suffrage is dumped on the internet. So there's no reason not to know. And for instance, all the books and speeches and writings of Elizabeth Cady Stanton, you click one click and you have her documents. So there's no reason not to know this history. Well, let's see. So I think somebody asked about uh, whether actual in school, perhaps did they have books or this, um, information included in their textbooks. And I know for sure that it's gonna be a state by state answer. So I can't give you a, uh, an umbrella or a universal answer for the entire United States. I think a few states are a little more progressive and you can get some of that information, but I would dare say that most uh, are very anemic when it comes to promulgating that information to the students. I'm, I'm working on getting my books in uh, several public schools. Um, with it being an overview, something to hopefully get their interest peaked such that they will then learn more. Uh, you'll never be able to learn it all in, in, in a high school type setting, but certainly more high schools are becoming more interested in having a better, well-rounded, more inclusive look at American history. Uh, but I think we're rather at the cusp of that at the moment. Tom? Um, I would like to add that um, there's um, a national women's a national history project, and uh, once a year, a nationwide competition with the ultimate winners going to Washington D.C. And what's great is that they'll give a topic. For instance, you suggested strategies, and so then the student can incorporate that idea of strategies but they can use it within the women's movement or maybe industrial strategies. But so every year um, I can see students are interested in this history and when given a choice, they follow, they pursue their interest. 
I agree. The interest is definitely growing. I, I've seen it grow, grow just in the last three to four years. Before that, when I started my project, hardly anybody knew what in the world I was talking about. So yes, it has definitely grown. Colleen is correct. And we have one more question. So uh, in the interest of time, we'll take one more question from the in-person audience. Uh, so the question from the audience is that we often hear about the sheroes um, of the movement. And I'm sorry, could you repeat that? And the big contributions uh, that, they've, uh, that they've made and contributed to the movement. And the question is, um, what can everyday average people do uh, to, in our lives uh, to sort of help I think it's a great question because, um, you know, I've just talked about my family, um, but uh, if you want a mass movement, you must include everybody. And uh, so, um, uh, you know, for instance, we, I, we own a collection of 3000 objects from the women's suffrage movement. I don't know who made these things. I don't know who sewed a banner. I don't know who made a fly swatter in New Jersey that said, votes for women and be happy. You know, I, I, the point is do something. Um, Elizabeth, Eleanor Roosevelt had a great story about some people going up the Amazon River on a boat and they ran out of drinking water and they said, what do we do, what do we do? And the point is put your bucket down where you are and pull it up and you will have water to drink. So the only thing I recommend is do something. I, I would say uh, I, get, I get very inspired by those who are willing to do something locally and not necessarily big. There are people that think really big and want to do mass marches and this and that. Uh, but those of us who do things on a little smaller scale, I think that's wonderful. Go to your public library, ask what books they have. You can definitely look online and find out other books and then request that your library have these books. Go to your local schools uh, or phone them up and say, are you including this information in textbook? Because I want to make sure that my children, my grandchildren, subsequent generations are receiving this information because it's pivotal in our thinking about who is the United States of America, what is our history, and it wasn't all just performed by men, uh, so that will be a big help. There's a lot of women's organizations. Uh, look up in your town, ask around. There are a lot of women's organizations who are always looking for volunteers, people who have the energy, the ideas to come up with programs, that perhaps you want to help stage something next March for Women's History Month or on August 26th for Women's Equality Day, which by the way, many people are advocating that August 26th become a federal holiday for women. We don't have any of those. So I'll put my plug in for that. Uh, so just search it out, start making a few phone calls, a few emails, ask some friends, family, uh, whatever organizations you're in, um, your work, you'll be amazed at how it will snowball. Uh, people will say, oh yeah, and the conversation will get going. So mostly start a conversation. So unfortunately, um, uh, we are running pretty low on time. Uh, and we thank you so much for sharing all of your experience and, and your thoughts about, uh, uh, about this really important time in American history. Um, do you have any final words that you'd like to share with the audience? Well, I mean, I am very, very grateful both to the university and the consulate uh, for making this possible. And I would say that uh, it's an extraordinary time now. We are reaching seven, over 7 billion people who, uh, with our messages. And uh, it's not necessarily go to your local museum, but remember the platform is so much larger. And uh, I think it's a beautiful time. 
my thought when you asked that, Tom, was to encourage everyone to do what is within your power and your desire to do. But I would hope that everyone would just start by educating yourself. It's just amazing where that goes because it changes your focus. It changes how you see the world. And then when you change, others around you will change. So do a little research, do a little reading. There's some pretty outrageous stories out there of what these women did and or outrageous stuff of what they went through and a lot of firsts. So it's very interesting stuff. I encourage you to, to read up on it. Share the information. Um, so uh, on behalf of the US consulate, on behalf of everybody here in this room, we really, really uh, wanna thank you both for joining us this evening or your morning and our evening um, and sharing uh, your thoughts about uh, these issues that still resonate today. Um, one of the major shared values that the United States and Hong Kong have um, are our focus on diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, so thank you for bringing to light this part of American history. Um, and that concludes uh, our program tonight. Thank you very much.